Hey, g'day. In this video, we're going to hear some encouraging messages from Rodney and Daphne, or as I would call them, Mum and Dad, and also Renelda before we get to the main message. After the main message, we're going to share communion together, so you may want to get that ready now. God bless you, and I'll see you later. Hi, everyone. What a joy it is this morning to, to be together again, even though we're in our homes, isolated at the moment, but it is a joy to be together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are grateful and thankful for what he's doing. We, we, I believe that God is doing a, a great work in us. God is doing things that we ha that, uh, that I cannot see. But God, we believe that God is on the move and he is doing great things in the earth. And, uh, and it's, 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 it's actually very exciting. We, we just believe that many will turn to him at this time of isolation, that many hearts will be turning to him. And we just want to give him praise because he is faithful and he is the only and true living God. It is a wonderful time and I believe a very a defining time in, in history. And uh, you know, I always remember my dad had a saying that he, which he often said, the future is hidden from your eyes. And, um, and it's, it's like that. And, but in many ways, this, this time reminds me that, you know, God has, he, he, he raised us up as, as a pioneering family. And, um, and as pioneers, you, you always arrive in somewhere where there's nothing. And your job is, is, is to let God guide you into creating what he wants you to create in that place mm -hmm. where there's nothing. And so we, uh, we have this great sense of trusting God at this time. It's, and it's very much like pregnancy. You know, uh, there is a conception that takes place and, and most times you don't know anything about it until probably two or three months down the track. And then it, mm -hmm. it's confirmed and there's a lot of excitement and yet with that excitement, there's also a lot of uncertainty because, because everything that's really happening, it's happening in secret. You can't, you can't see it, and like you make the external preparations, but the the, the, the greater thing, the thing that's going to bring the excitement and the, the celebration is it's it's in secret, and and I just really see this time uh, that the church is in is like that. You know, so many times I remember saying over the years that, that we've been in the city that um, that things are going to change. That church will not look, Different. you know, in the future, it's not going to look the way it looked now. And uh, But at the same time, I had no idea what, what it's going to look like, except that just you just have this conviction. And, and God doesn't take these convictions away from you. And I just think there's... There's so many things that even you watching now, you know, you've had prophecies in your life and, and you've not seen it. And, and I just believe that, you know, in this time when you're just sitting alone or lying down alone or whatever you're doing by yourself, it's uh, like God will just bring these things back to mind. And he says, remember this word that I conceived in your heart years ago. It's not God. It's been growing in secret and yet you didn't know it. And yet it's growing in secret. And um, But I believe that now is the time we are getting ready yeah. to see the birthing of many things that is just incredible, like like eyes not seen yeah. on the earth. Yeah. Yeah. Hi everyone, it's me. I'm coming to you from my muddy in Gordon. And uh, we, I just had a, <laughs> a, a scripture that I've been... Uh, thinking on and it's from uh, 1 Samuel and chapter 30 um, it's the verses uh, talking about King David when he was greatly distressed and it says that uh, David strengthened himself in the Lord his God and um, that verse has really been encouraging for our family um, over the last um, little while uh, as we've been going through this um, uh, a period of self isolating at home. We really love this verse because it talks about um, how 
how we are to be as God's people. God's people are meant to be a people that are strengthening themselves. Um, and the way we do that is reading his word and just spending time with him. Um, it's so important um, as we don't have... Um, we don't have normal church services at the moment that we're going to. Um, we're not meeting together with other people as we're accustomed to and as we love to do and we love encouraging each other. We love meeting together and seeing everyone's faces and um, you know sharing things that God's been speaking to us. Um, and But at the moment we're not able to do that. And so now more than ever, it's so important that God's people would be a people like King David was. He said he, he was distressed and he strengthened himself in the Lord. Um, so just a quick encouragement from our home to yours. Let's, let's make sure that we don't drop the ball as far as reading God's word. It's so important, such a simple thing, but so important, so vital to our strength. God's word is our food. It's what sustains us. So let's keep reading his word. Let's not forget to spend time with the Lord, especially as our a lot of our schedules have changed. And when your schedules have changed, you know, you might be used to reading his word in the morning uh, or, or, or at any particular time. But because your schedules change, maybe, you know, you've been dropping the ball. Let's let's just uh, remember, you know, if we need to reschedule things, we need to make a new time. But let's make sure we do it. Let's make sure we spend time with the Lord, reading his word, um, worshipping him, listen, listen to music. You know, these are all just really simple things, but I think really important to remind ourselves of um, in these days um, because these things are going to keep us vital. They're going to keep us vibrant and keep us... Um, you know, um, motivated and, and, and to be of use to, to those that we're living with, you know, we're, we're living with one another um, and we need to stay um, encouraged in, in the Lord. So let's, let's keep doing that. Well, hello. Once again, today we're looking at the presence of God and today is a practical uh, look at how do I come into the presence of God. And so here we go. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to 23. It says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And a couple of supporting scriptures here, we'll read them now. It's in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 13 says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And Ephesians Chapter 3, verse 12 says, In whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. So the writer of Hebrews has really three uh, parts of his message that he, well, three things that he talks about Christ. And then he had, we're going to look at two things that he says about us. And of course, it takes uh, both. God and us working with God uh, in order for us to come into the presence of God. Uh, our faith is always an active faith. We, it is not passive. And so for us to come into the presence of God, there is something we participate in. We activate it. We, we, we actively um, are meant to pursue it. So I put it like this. If I was to come over to your house... You know, presumably, you know, you're gonna. There's an invitation implied. You know, there. So I'd come. I'd need to knock on the door, isn't it? And then the person inside the house would then have the opportunity to open up the door and invite their guest in. And that's what it's like with God. In in a sense, you know, we are invited 
to his presence and we have uh, a part to play we can come and we can knock on the door and God is the one who opens it so you know if any one of these elements fall fall out or, or don't happen you know we 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 lose a sense of what it is to come into the presence of God don't we we lose a sense of what it is to commune with him if I knock on the door you know I could knock until my fingers bleed in a sense it doesn't necessarily make the person inside the door open up you know they don't have to open up so there's a very uh, lovely picture in that God is willing to allow us into his presence and he does open up that door and so I want to look at God first I want to look at him and partly because also the, the scriptures uh, the Hebrews sort of puts our mind there first and what he has in his mind I think is he's got this picture of the high priest entering into the holy of holies into that place where the ark of the covenant is the presence of God is meant to be in that in that place and and he compares it to Christ but the picture has three parts to it you know it's got uh, the blood of Christ it's got the veil which is torn and it has also got the high priest itself and those are the three parts we're going to look at in God's side of the equation but we're also going to later on look at the two two elements for us as well so when a high priest would enter into the holy of holies he needed an atoning sacrifice you know he would they would place their hand on the animal and you know that's where the sins of the people would be placed on that animal and they would take the blood and they would be able to enter into the holy of holies um, using this blood and jesus christ is the real sacrificial lamb he is the real atoning sacrifice either in the old testament this sacrifice of the high priest would need to be done yearly by christ because he is the real it is once and for all and so we have a, a much greater living hope for us today atonement can be understood like this and the meaning you know the simplest meaning is in the word itself you know at atonement could be understood as at one moment you know it is at the very heart of atoning it is that we would be made one that we would come back into fellowship and friends let me say that everything about the cross everything about what it means to be a christian everything about uh, the death and resurrection of jesus christ at its heart has fellowship on its mind it has it has fellowship at the center of it all it has um, it, God wants us to come back to him he has relationship in his heart and so a lot of these things though the picture may seem um, really legalistic and ceremonial and we're trying to work out what's going on but you got to know at the very heart of it God is just placing all these things in order so that relationship can be restored and this picture of atonement runs into the old testament and it runs all the way really back into genesis right into the book of genesis we have this the the first couple we have adam and eve uh it says they fall they they have a fall they disobey god and you know one of the interesting things about this is that they before they're even kicked out of the garden before before god deals with them in that way but uh, they self-isolate they they themselves are separating themselves from god they're hiding in the garden uh, because of what they have done and it says the reason why you know they were hiding it says because we are naked because you know we are they've realized that they were naked and the bible says they were naked and they were ashamed and they tried to sew fig leaves together but it didn't work and so what god does is he makes a garment for them out of the skins of an animal and right there in genesis we have god at work we have him making this uh setting in motion this this precedent of atonement of covering people uh, through the sacrifice of an animal 
And so we have this atoning. Now this atoning isn't just uh, a benefit to us. It's not just God did this so we could get that. It is that, but it is so much more. It is, it is God taking our place. It is God uh, in atoning. You know, in the Old Testament, they would place their hand on the animal, and that animal would symbolically, you know, take their sins and be sacrificed on their behalf, uh, because, uh, as the Bible says, the wages of sin is death, and so. Uh, God in Jesus Christ is actually taking our place and that is a really important element of all of this and man I, I some, sometimes when we just because um, we're being in church and maybe we grow familiar with these things but man it's just got to grab your heart again you know that God is in my place he's not just uh, benefiting me it's not just something that he did for me but it's something that he did as me uh, on the cross and so that it really does take our breath away and the wonderful description that it adds to this blood of Christ in Hebrews is that it says by a new and living way and so in Jesus Christ the blood being, sh being shed was not as we said a, a, it wasn't just Christ playing out or coming as another high priest and doing something that had been done but what Christ is doing is something new something that had never been done before and will never be done be have to be done again Jesus does this in a new way he brings access into the very throne of God into the real presence of God and so he has given us a new way see when we think about new we think about you know new technology but you know it's new today you know it's new this year maybe but next year we know that something else new is going to come but that's not the way the bible is using this word new it's using the word new and always new it is always fresh it's not as if in 2020 we have to discover Oh, what's the new way in which we get to the presence of God? No, it is the same way which has ever been made new for us. And it says it's a new and living way. And this is the amazing thing about our bodies, isn't it? We are constantly, every cell in our body is being renewed. It's been always, it's ever changing. We're always in the process of change. We're always becoming new. We don't have the same skin, the same blood, you know, where our whole bodies are being remade over in our lifetime, uh, a number of times over. And this is what it's like in Christ Jesus. The way that he brings us this, this sacrificial blood, this, this atoning death of Christ is continually new and it is continually effective and it is a living way um, making us to come into a living hope the way that we look at this term uh, living it also applies to us in that we are not uh, going about in dead works of the flesh and we looked at last week how we can often try to fulfill you know through good works through uh, religious works even and through through um, you know keeping of a law so to speak we could try to get into the presence of God and yet that doesn't cut it that's not what this scripture is asking us for it's asking for a living way something that starts as life within us and flows out of us we cannot earn it but we get it by gift just like all life is a gift uh, we are going to read into this scripture a bit more the second thing that it says in hebrews it talks about his blood and then it talks about the veil and now in matthew chapter 27 verse 51 it tells us that that veil is torn from top to bottom and this is just that classic verse that is used to describe how we have access to god and one of the interesting things I find about um, the veil and really a lot of the um, clothing and everything to do with the priesthood, you know, they have this color scheme that runs through it. 
and that is blue, red and purple. And we have that again here uh, represented in um, the veil. And blue represents everything divine. It's looking upwards, it's looking to God. Um, it is, you know, even, you know, the sky itself is blue. When we look up, it's, it's blue most of the time, depending on where you live, I guess. But it's blue and we, we can see that this is something um, above us, something divine. But red speaks about us, it speaks about mankind, it's, it's um, you know, the other word that's used for red in the Bible is scarlet, and our sins are described as being like scarlet, so, so red. And Jesus is the perfect uh, picture of both the blue, both that divine uh, nature, and also humanity in that he came in the weakness of sinful flesh he came like us now when you mix blue and red together what do you get you get purple now purple was a really expensive color for them to manufacture and back in bible times and so generally only kings wore the color purple so what do we have in jesus christ we have blue and we have red we have divine and we have humanity and they're perfectly linked together in jesus christ and he becomes also the king of the world you know and the, and this is the the veil that is ripped open you know it is torn open for us you know from top to bottom this is god at work ripping open uh, the way to him it was ripped so that it's it's not just simply parted and then it could you know be closed again but it's torn so it's open for all time for all people and that is the power of god hebrews seems uh, you know the writer of hebrews seems to really be thinking about this because the word that he used for high priest is not the usual word or it's not the word that he uses in all the other places in the book of hebrews but he um, he used a different Greek word, and that Greek word is really talking about a great priest, not a not the high priest as he used in other places, but a great priest. He's talking about a king priest, and the important thing that we take away from that is that in this picture, he's seen God, he's seen Christ as not only the priest, but as a king. See, in a priest, he is rep he's is the people he's representing the people to God but as a king he is representing God to mankind and that is the picture that he's trying to fill our minds with that this is really God in action in every way shape and form bringing us into the presence of God so what is this to us you know how what what application is 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 entailed for us I think it shows us this all that it means to be a Christian all that it means to live in the fellowship of God has nothing to do with our performance it has nothing to do with our growth or development it has has nothing to do with those things you know it's not as if we are you know if I just work on these particular elements in my life and then I would make a a good Christian or I would get into the presence of God no the the thing that makes anyone a believer anyone a Christian anyone to come uh, to God is that they have been brought near it is relationship it is that is the thing that makes all the difference it is one's relationship to God that changes everything if we were to weigh up our whole Christian experience in simply, you know, a moral change or moral growth, then we are somehow we're missing the whole point. It's all to do with our relationship with God. Uh, and it, it, one of the things that um, sometimes we we do this in in churches that we like to pick out people that have got this really great testimony don't we we like to find those people that have you know really experienced some um really harsh things in life or really been a really bad person if you like and then they came to christ and and everything changed in their life we like to celebrate those type of testimonies and then 
a lot of us that have just got very plain and normal and ordinary testimonies, we don't really like to talk about our testimony. We feel a bit embarrassed about it because it just seems so boring, so mundane. And the other thing is that, you know, because we've just got this boring testimony, we start to think to ourselves, gee, you know, I, I wish that I had done all of those things, you know, before I got saved. Then when I got saved, I could have this really great testimony like, like these other ones, you know. But no, I think if we start to think that way, once again, we are missing the whole point. Our salvation is not something of behaviour, but it is something of distance. We have been separated from God. This is the, this is the wonder. This is the glory of it all. It's not that we have, have gone from being bad people and we've become good people. It's not that we've become, gone from immoral people to moral people. It's not that we have gone from hateful people into loving people. I thank God that those things happen as well. But it is about that we have come into the presence of God. We have been brought near by His blood. Now that has got to speak something to us. And the wonderful thing about this is we have been brought near by His blood. And what does that tell us? What, what, what's so significant about that? Well, this is what's significant about it. See, God... God has to maintain the fact that He is holy. He has to maintain the fact that He is, is holy, righteous, He is upright, He is 100% pure. And for Him to maintain that position and welcome sinners in, welcome fallen ones in, welcome the immoral in, welcome those who are in darkness into His glorious light, you know, how does he maintain that uh, cleanness while welcoming in someone who is uh, filthy, someone who has fallen? Well, God does it by his blood. See, he takes our place. He does a work so that he is both the just, he's both just and the justifier. See, when Christ goes to the cross, he punishes our sin. He, he becomes filthy for us. He takes on all the filthiness and he nails it to the cross and, and, and we bear it no more. You know, we become justified in his sight. We have been made new in Jesus Christ. Our sins are forgotten. Our sins are done with. You know, there's this very real sense that what Jesus does in heaven for us, when he stands before the Father, he's not saying, God, have, have mercy upon this poor sinner. You know, when we turn to God in faith, he's not saying, God, have mercy upon this poor sinner. But what he's saying is, God, you know, have, he, he execute justice. He's calling for justice. Why can he call for justice? It's because he's saying, I have paid for that sin. I have accomplished. I have dealt with it. This has been paid for. You know, so when Christ is in heaven interceding for us, he is not calling for mercy. He is calling for justice. And the just shall live by faith. And so this is the power. This is why it is so important that we see that it is by his blood. In the passages in Ephesians that we read, it tells us that, well, that we were meant to come in with boldness, you know, and we have access um, into this place, into the presence of God through boldness, through the, uh, through the blood of Jesus Christ. And in Ephesians, it, it's really practical for us, and this is our real practical, practical takeaways from this scripture, is in Ephesians, the whole context of Ephesians is really wrapped up in prayer. And you see this sort of prayer language right there in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. He says, Blessed be the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. So he's got this sort of prayer language on. And in verse 15 and 16, it says that he sees the faith and he sees the love of these people. So he continually makes gives thanks and makes mention of them in prayer in verse 
in, in prayer in verse 16. And also we know in chapter 3 also he says, for this reason I bow my knee. And so the whole context of Ephesians, you know, pretty much the whole book is all wrapped up in this context of prayer. And this is sort of something of how we enter into the presence of God, isn't it? You know, this is the practical application. We have this great sense that the presence of God is everywhere and always active and always around us. And yet in us applying it, it is often applied through prayer. Now, our prayer can be formal and at times it is also um, informal. And we're going to look at how both in the formal sense and in the informal sense, how we come into the presence of God through prayer. Now, when I say formal, I mean, you know, times that we set aside where we're on our knees, where we're in our prayer closet or we're in our room, you know, specific times, specific times that we set aside for prayer. And informal, I mean, as we're going about our normal daily work and our duties, you know, that we can also enter into the presence of God in that sense. And, and that too is a kind of prayer. And the things that make it a kind of prayer I think is this, is that we think something of God. You know, all of prayer, you know, this is what Jesus taught us in, in how to pray. He says, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. You know, the very, very essence of God is thinking something about him, is, is, is first of all casting our mind upon who he is. And that is what uh, creates in us I think this boldness to come into the presence of God and if, and Hebrews tells us that therefore we are meant to come into this boldness <laughs> and once again I love the way it starts with therefore you know there is a sense that the whole of Hebrews is really building up to this point of that therefore you know all the things that he explains about how Christ is the fulfillment of all the law and all the prophets and everything he comes to this chapter and he says therefore now we have boldness to act as the presence of God and can I say this in prayer it must we must come in boldly in prayer. Now, yeah, last week I was looking at this really big picture of God, wanting to show us how great and glorious God is. And but I'm, I'm, it is a, it is a fine line that we tread when we go that way because we become really religious. We become, <laughs> we become really uh, full with a, a sort of false humility at times. You know where we where we sort of cower in the presence of God, where because of his greatness, because of all of how big he is, we, we sort of come in this sort of weak uh, uh, sense. And that's not what God is getting at for us. No, he wants us to come in boldly. But then there's this other side that, you know, is, is kind of flippant. It's kind of approaching his presence, you know, in a kind of just too relaxed sort of way, a, a way that isn't really thinking about God. It, it is a, a sort of um, a confidence in our own self rather than a confidence in God. And this scripture is challenging both ends of that scale. It is saying you should have boldness, but the reason why you have boldness is because he made a way through his blood, through the veil, and through himself, through his priesthood through his kingship, he has made a way. And that is how we enter in with confidence. And so here we are, you know, confidence is something that, you know, it grows with time, doesn't it? The more time that we have in a particular thing, the more confident we become in it. And this is, uh, again, really practically say we need, you know, it's calling us to have t spend time in the present, spend time in understanding God, spend time in 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 the different uh, disciplines of the scriptures. Now, there, I think there is two types of people generally. You know, we have this um, experiential sort of people, people that are, are really quick to want to experience it. You know, they want to get involved in it. And they're not too uh, concerned about the details, not going to be too concerned about uh, all the theology or anything like that. And so this scripture challenges uh, us who are in the experiential crowd 
to learn more about God because it only increases the experience. Once we, once we know the depths of his love, once we see what his blood accomplished for us, it increases the experience for us. And then there's the other group of people that are more you know, inclined just to facts and figures and theology and, and you know, they have a more sort of structured routine in life and stuff and it challenges that also it says no for all of those sort of people you are to experience this you're meant to enter into this thing with boldness and confidence in christ so on both ends of the scale we come into this uh, boldness in verse 22 uh, it says let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water and there are times i guess when we we would say this is true of us but i don't know about you when i read that i'm thinking let us draw near yeah that's great with a true heart and you know there's something within us that, that questions that i question that i question do i have it is my heart really true you know is my conscience really clear when i come before god uh well and if it isn't how do i get beyond that how do i you know, it's easy to see how it applies when when I do feel that. And here's the here's the difficulty for those who are more in that experiential group is because um, we have times when we feel we feel alive, we feel true in our heart, we feel our conscience is clear. And but we cannot only come to God when we feel that we've got to be able to come to God all the time. This access is open 24 seven. How do we approach God at when times when we just don't feel it? Well, uh, in verse 23, he doesn't leave us high and dry, but he tells us, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. <laughs> See, we've got to hold fast our confession uh, without wavering there are times and i think that times are often in prayer we come in with the intention of being bold entering in we're coming uh, with our confidence we're coming standing up and, you know this is what kids do kids don't don't care where you're at what you're doing they just come in confidently they burst through the door you could be in the middle of the most important thing you know, but they'll come in and we've got to learn something about that from kids you know this confidence and that's how we come into the presence of god confidently into his presence he wants us around and we want to be around him so we come in with confidence, but what about those times when we feel sheepish? We don't know if we really are in the right place. Well, we preach to ourselves. We tell ourselves, we hold on to our confession. We hold on to our hope. We do not waver. We say, no, this is what Jesus has done for me. And he stands in my place. Uh, you know, I have often said that there is a sort of sense of humor in this when we come and the accuser especially comes to accuse us with different things because what we can say to the accuser is you know when he says oh you're failing in this or you you had this um you did this thing last week or you said that thing or you you thought like this or in a particular way you know we could say to the enemy you don't know the half of what i'm capable of you know we are capable of much worse but the thing is it does not depend upon my works to come into his presence. No, I come by the blood of Christ. And so this is my confession in prayer. It's really practical how I come into the presence of God. It is through my confession. What I choose to hold on to. Will I hold on to my mistakes? Will I hold on to my failures, Or will I hold on to the blood of Christ and his promises and his faithfulness for me? Glory. We would like to take a moment now to come around the Lord's table. Um, we've been talking about this access that we have by the blood of Jesus Christ. And today, um, wherever you are, if you could find, you know, some bread or some juice or something in which you're able to do this, you could pause the video, go get that and come back and join me. But for those who 
maybe have something like that on hand you can continue watching and what I'm going to do now is just simply take the biscuit represents the body of Christ and this cup uh, this juice that represents his blood and we're going to break it we're going to pray and we thank God that he comes to us and he has made an everlasting way for us to come into his presence so God, I thank you for your body broken for us on the cross. I thank you for all that, uh, that you took all of our burden, you took all of our sin and took it upon yourself. I also thank you that we are a part of your body. We are a part of the body of Christ. And I thank you that all across the world and all across our nation right now there are so many believers meeting together we remember that our fellowship with you is not individualistic but it is with the whole body of Christ we are joined together in our fellowship with you and so we celebrate that today and we thank you for it in Jesus name We also take the cup that represents the blood of Jesus. We thank you, God, for that you have shed your blood for us and indeed for all mankind, that whoever believes in you can partake and can come into the presence of God and share your table and come into all the blessings and all the goodness of God. And we thank you for that free access that we have to you right now. Thank you, God, that your blood truly does wash away our deeper sins and cleanses our conscience. And I thank you, God, for every, every failing that we have, every way that we have turned from you. We hand it over to you, God, and that it would, would not hinder our way any further. We hand it over to you and hand ourselves to your grace that you would help us in our life and in our journey. You would help us to live for you and to love one another. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you everyone and may you have a very good week.